Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're so excited that so many of you could join us today for On Keeping the Earth. I'm Alex Elliott, the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. Now let me first introduce our presenters, N. Scott Mamaday and Melissa K. Nelson, and then we'll get right into the conversation. Melissa K. Nelson is an ecologist, writer, editor, media maker, and indigenous scholar activist. Her work is dedicated to indigenous rights and sustainability, biocultural heritage and environmental justice, intercultural solidarity, and the renewal and celebration of community health and cultural arts. She actively advocates for indigenous people's rights and sustainable life ways in higher education, nonprofits, and philanthropy, and is particularly passionate about indigenous food sovereignty at local, regional, and global levels. Melissa served as a professor of American Indian Studies at San Francisco State University from 2002 to 2020. She is now professor of indigenous sustainability at Arizona State University and continues to work with the Cultural Conservancy, which she has led since 1993. Melissa is the editor of and a contributor to Original Instructions, Indigenous Teachings for a Sustainable Future, and co-editor of and contributor to Traditional Ecological Knowledge, Learning from the Indigenous Practices for Environmental Sustainability. N. Scott Mamaday was born in 1934 in Lawton, Oklahoma. A poet, novelist, playwright, teacher, and painter, his accomplishments in literature, scholarship, and the arts have established him as an enduring American master. He is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the Pulitzer Prize for his novel, House Made of Dawn, a National Medal of Arts, the Academy of American Poets Prize, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Lifetime Achievement, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Ambassador Richard C. Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award. A longtime professor of English and American literature, Dr. Mamaday earned his PhD from Stanford University and retired as Regents Professor at University of Arizona. He lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And now it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Scott and Melissa. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Alex. Uh, this is such an honor to be here with you all today and to be with N. Scott Mamaday. In my tradition, I'm taught that when you sit at the feet of an elder like N. Scott Mamaday, you always offer something so that you get some good stories. So Scott, I offer you some digital tobacco um, that I grew and some uh, digital sage that we grew, uh, two sacred medicines of Native America um, to honor your wisdom, your lifetime of incredible work and your contributions to Native heritage. So thank you, it's an honor to be here with you. I also Melissa, wanna, thank you very much. Mm, yes. I also wanna acknowledge the first peoples of San Francisco Bay Area, the Ramitushaloni of the San Francisco Peninsula where California Institute of Integral Studies stands and all the Ohlone nations and villages and Coast Miwoks people of the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area where we are located. I really honor their ancestors, their, their current communities and their future generations and really thank them for taking care of this beautiful land. And I really wish and hope that we can create more sustainable landscapes here. So Scott, you have just completed another marvelous book, uh, Earth Keeper. Here it is, oh, oh, there it is, Earth Keeper. And I just finished it last night, Reflections on the American Land. Such a beautiful, beautiful poetic prose. And for those of us um, on the, in the audience who have not been able to read your book yet, can you please share what it means to you to be a keeper of the earth? Yes. Um, I have been a long time advocate of conservation, preserving the, the American land. Uh, it, uh, is, it is uh, very important to me. I was born 
uh, in the Southern Plains. And that landscape means a great deal to me. It uh, contains the blood of my ancestors. And uh, so I have a special reverence for the land and I enjoy writing about it. I enjoy getting out into it. So those are my qualifications for writing this book, which means a lot to me. I was very pleased to have written it. Mm, beautiful. And it seems to be such a profound tradition of indigenous peoples the world over. I know you've been to Siberia and Africa. And um, I've been fortunate to travel to some amazing places as well to meet with the native peoples of the land. And this idea of being an earth keeper or an, or an earth guardian is such a long and deep tradition. And yet we've seen that many cultures dropped this tradition and it's gotten us into our predicament that we're in today in an unsustainable world that is polluted with many environmental issues. Why do you think it is that native peoples have retained against all great odds, this tradition of being an earth keeper while other cultures sadly dismissed it? I think that the Native American especially has been on this continent for thousands of years. And I think in, the, in that tenure, he has developed a, a, a strong uh, affinity for the land and understanding that the land is possessed of spirit, it is sacred. And so he has uh, an advantage over other people who have not had the same kind of experience, long-term experience of the landscape. And so he has a vested interest in it and it, to him it is sacred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, absolutely. And it's sacred in specific places like you as a Kiowa and me as Ojibwe and the local Ohlone people. It's really tied to our specific homelands and landscapes. And you write quite a bit about the beautiful buffalo that has roamed across Turtle Island, North America for so long. And um, can you share a little bit more about the relationship of the Kiowa and the buffalo and some of your stories of the buffalo that you share so beautifully in your writings? You know, the Kiowas migrated to the Southern Plains from the North. The earliest uh, evidence we have of them places them near the headwaters of the Yellowstone River in what is now Western Montana. And for some reason, they came down out of the mountains and entered upon the Great Plains, the Northern Plains, uh, where they formed alliances with the Crow people for, for one group, continued their migration southward and eastward down the rain shadow of the Rockies, and finally into the Southern Plains, uh, where they still reside in uh, southwestern Oklahoma. And in the course of that migration, of course, they Many, many wonderful things happened to them. They acquired horses and they discovered buffalo on the, on the land. And at that time, as you know, the buffalo uh, were numberless. Uh, I think we estimate that there were at one time at least 30 million animals on the plains. And so they adopted this animal as it were. It became for them the, the uh, animal representation of the sun and of course, they were a Sundance people. So the, 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 the buffalo um, represented for them uh, food, shelter, lodging, utensils, everything. They made use of every part of the animal. And so when the buffalo were brought to extinction by hunters uh, outside the plains, uh, it was a devastation and it brought down the plains culture. You can't overestimate the importance of the buffalo. That's right. That's right. And fortunately today, um, the great Blackfoot Nation and many First Nations in Canada and um, Montana, um, the Northern Plains are regenerating the buffalo and bringing them back through the Buffalo Treaty. And I know that you have created a new organization, the Buffalo Trust, really dedicated to Native American heritage and preserving some of these traditions. Can you share a little bit more about this initiative? Yes, uh, I founded the Buffalo Trust some years ago and it has been 
it has been a um, uh, value to uh, to native peoples. I've uh, worked uh, with the trust in the Southwest and in Alaska and in Siberia, and so we have uh, we have achieved a good deal. Uh, for one thing, we brought the bear ceremony back to the Hanti people in in uh, Western Siberia, and it was on the verge of extinction. So we've done some good things, and uh, we we hope to do more. Mm. You bring up the beautiful bear, another totem animal like our, our buffalo of North America. And in fact, your name is very much connected to the bear. You are a bear, as you've said in, in many interviews and films. Can you share a little bit about the importance of your relationship to the bear and the bear medicine that has really inspired your life? That's a that's an intricate and complicated question because <laughs> the bear means so much to me in so many ways. When I was an infant, I was taken to Devil's Tower, Wyoming, which is that great monolith. I think it was the first uh, public uh, national park in the country, national monument anyway. And um, I was an infant when I was taken there, but it is a sacred place to the Kiowas. They they tell a story about it, uh, about uh, uh, a, a boy who was who turned into a bear, and he ran after his seven sisters, who climbed the who mounted the the stump of the tree, which is called Soai in Kiowa, uh, rock tree, and as they as they climbed on top of the the stump, the bear came to harm them but they were beyond its reach. The, trump, the, the stump of the tree grew up into the sky, bore the sisters into the sky, and they became the stars of the Big Dipper. Mm. And the bear uh, was left there at the, at the base of the tree. And uh, I think he's still there in one of my visions. In fact, I see him there. Mm. And because, because I was taken to this very sacred place as a, as a child, I was given the name Tsoai Tali, Rock Tree Boy. And I identify with the boy who turned into a bear. I think that I'm the reincarnation of that boy. And so the bear is very meaningful to me. We have a strange relationship, the bear and I. Sometimes mm -hmm. we fight each other and sometimes we get along famously. Yes. <laughs> and like a bear, do you have a season for berry picking and a season for hibernation? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Following all. And your name isn't cycles. your name? Is, and mine don't you name have is the name bear, to the bear in your name? Too. I absolutely. Yes, do. I thought so. Yes. There, yes. There you so have it. young yeah. young bear woman standing in the morning, dew or mist or fog, some some moisture. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes. So um, the <laughs> bear is a great teacher for me too. And Leroy Little Bear, the Blackfoot leader, is a also a teacher of mine who is also related to the bear. Yeah, wonderful. And you mentioned this great sacred place, Devil's Tower, is it is known. But we know that that is a colonial name. That is not its first name. And so much of your work is about the power of words and the power of naming. Can you say a little bit about naming and claiming and, and how place names are so critical? Um, you know, we call it Devil's Tower, but all of the tribes of that local area have their own names for that place. And why is it important that we really try to bring back some of those native names for some of these sacred places? Yes, naming is is very important among native peoples. Uh, when one, one who has no name can not be said to exist, we think. And so names are critically important. And, and Indian names are, are sacred. Uh, Tsoai, Rock Tree, is a much better name than Devil's Tower, it seems to me. I don't know, I don't know the origin of Devil's Tower. I don't know where that name came from. But uh, I call that monolith Tsoai, rock tree. And it has to be seen to be believed. I don't know if you've been there, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the monument Incredible. itself is, uh, is uh, one of the great features of the landscape. It uh, is a, 
I guess it's a volcanic core, but it rises a thousand feet or nearly a thousand feet into the air from base to summit. It's a mile around at its base. So it is truly remarkable and unique. And no wonder, no wonder those uh, native peoples who, who discovered it or who lived in its presence, no wonder they think of it as sacred. It is sacred. Absolutely. It's such a powerful place. I was very fortunate to go there with my father once and it was just stunning, absolutely stunning. And I later asked some of my Lakota friends about it and they were saying how it's very connected to the whole sacred geography all the way over to the Black Hills and many of the other landscape <laughs> uh, markers there. It's a really a large sacred landscape. We often think of the sacred places as just one spot, but they're related through a whole geography that covers a much larger area. So that is a very yes, special yes. place. Yeah, wonderful. Um, you've also talked a bit about the important role of imagination in so much of your writings and your poetry really invokes and evokes an imaginative quality. You've even said to quote you from one of your writings, you have written that we are what we imagine. Our very existence consists in our imagination of ourselves. Our best destiny is to imagine at least completely who and what and that we are. The greatest tragedy that can befall us is to go unimagined. Can you speak a bit about the role of imagination and how do you nourish your imagination? And what can you suggest for others to nourish their imaginations? I think if you're if you're a creative person, you rely heavily upon the imagination. I think of the imagination as that which enables us to see beyond reality. You see the mountain, but you imagine the valley on the other side. It is a way of seeing beyond the ordinary. And that is of crucial importance to writers, to people who write, to storytellers, to artists of different kinds. So the imagination, I think, uh, cannot be overestimated. It's crucial to our experience as human beings. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And at the very end of Earthkeeper, um, near the end, you also say, we have suffered a poverty of the imagination, a loss of innocence. And there was something very bittersweet and poignant about that. In the way that you structure the book, there is, there is dawn in the beginning, and then there is dusk. And in the end, you speak a bit more about the challenges that humanity faces right now. And again, speak to this loss of imagination as something that uh, needs to be addressed. So I'm curious yes. <laughs> again, you know, what for for what can be done to nourish the imagination? We have to imagine ourselves. We have to, especially now that we are faced with the crisis of global warming, uh, climate change. We have to reinvent our relationship to the land. We have done great damage to the earth, as you know, um, and it has to be repaired. We have to go back and, and uh, try to restore it to its, its sacred significance. So it's a matter of understanding. It's a matter of imagining. And uh, we had better be about it because we're running out of time, it seems to me. You know, we, every day we grow closer and closer to uh, d real destruction of ourselves because we fail to appreciate the earth, fail to do homage to the earth, fail to understand the spiritual essence of the earth. Mm. Mm. So true, so beautiful. And it seems that, you know, for me, so much of the imagination, as you said, is, is tied to the land and seeing the mountains and seeing the clouds and seeing animal tracks and imagining where is that animal going. And it's connected also to listening and, and the art of listening, listening to, you know, non-human nature, so to speak. 
And as a poet, you seem to be a great listener. The poetry, the music of your poetry is so beautiful. Can you share a little bit about the art of listening, both to nature and to your own creative process so that it can precipitate out as words or poetry, or in your case, as paintings as well? You know, um, I, I have spent a lot of my life um, studying uh, the oral tradition, the oral tradition of the Native American, especially. And um, when I was a when I was a small boy, my father told me stories when I could first understand language. And uh, those stories have never been written down. Well, I, I did write them down eventually, but but uh, some of them, but uh, they have existed for untold generations by word of mouth. The oral tradition is much stronger than we realize. I think uh, Peter Farb, a writer who wrote about the oral tradition, said that over half the population of the world at this point in time does without writing. And that gives you an idea of how important the oral tradition is even in our time. And the oral tradition is predicated upon three principles in particular. The, the storyteller or the speaker must speak responsibly. The listener must listen carefully and he must remember what he hears. Those things are essential to language itself. And, uh, you know, writing, I can, I can talk about writing in this way because I am a writer, but writing is only about six or 7,000 years old as far as we know, and the oral tradition is inestimably older, much older. And uh, I'm interested in the origin of language because the origin of language and oral tradition grew up at about the same time, I think. And so I, I can't tell you, I can't say enough about my regard for the oral tradition. I think it is in many ways more vital than writing. And the, the chief uh, example of oral tradition we have in our time is probably theater, where you have actors on the stage, they're speaking uh, from their own mouths, they're making eye contact with the audience, they have uh, the advantage of intonation. And so we have the oral tradition before us on the stage. It's very, it's very exciting and dramatic. And uh, so I have... Uh, uh, maybe I've said enough about the oral tradition, but you can understand no, how can deeply carry. involved with it I am. Oh, it's yeah. it's beautiful. I mean, you're such an extraordinary storyteller and the quality of your voice and the images that you paint with your words. Um, it's clear that your father um, shared that deep tradition with you very well. As you say, the oral tradition requires um, the, the storyteller. Uh, it requires deep and careful listening and it requires memory. And so much of your work talks about the role of memory, um, the memory of your lifetime, uh, the memory of the land, the memory of ancestors. And you also write and talk about blood memory. Uh, memory is so important to indigenous people passed on orally through heart and minds and voice throughout the generations. But today, so many people are focused on the future and are focused on little sound bites of information. Do you think that memory has atrophied in the human being? Uh, have you seen that change over time? Yes, I think, I think it has. Uh, we rely less upon memory than we once did, I think. And, and speaking of blood memory, yes, I think we are possessed of a, a kind of genetic memory, blood memory, we call, we call it. And it's very important to us. I know that uh, some of my relatives, my grandmother, for example, um, she could talk about places where she had never been. You know, she's, she's talking, speaking out of some kind of memory that we don't clearly understand, but it's there. It's there, and it's very, it's very important. We carry around in our in our in our bones and blood. Um, uh, an understanding of the earth as it was before we, before we were born. I sometimes think that uh, we, we, live our, we live lives over and over again. 
you know, the, the Kaya would say that they came into the world through a hollow log. And uh, in my mind's eye and in my blood memory, I can, I can imagine that log and I can think that I was there and I was watching them emerge from it one by one. Now there's something important about that kind of recollection, that kind of imagination. It's uh, sacred to us. And the Indian has it in spades. Um, uh, I think that uh, many of us have lost, lost that sense of, of, uh, of memory, sense of, of uh, the prehistoric world in which we all have such a great part. You know, language was, we don't know when it uh, came about, but uh, it, it is the, th the thing that distinguishes us as human beings. It is the thing that separates us from all other species. Other, other kinds of life have, have uh, language, but not in the sense that we have it. It's an invention of mankind. You know, we have a grammatic, a grammar, a system of grammar and a, a vocabulary that is now, I think the English vocabulary is far in excess of 500,000 words. So we, we have this to our credit. We have invented something that, uh, uh, that enables us to, to, uh, to uh, lead the world in certain ways, but we are inundated by writing. You know, you can go into a bookstore and you can suddenly find yourself in the presence of more books than you can read in your lifetime. In the, in the, in the uh, oral tradition, you dare not take language for granted. You know, it's too precious. It's, uh, it's not to be thrown away. It's not, we're not to be inundated in the oral tradition as we are in writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, beautifully stated. And the power of words that you've talked about so much, um, words and stories can be medicine as in our ceremonies and they can heal with the chants and the medicine chants. But words can also be weapons or word arrows as Gerald Visner talks about, they can actually harm. So it's very important that, like you said, that we are careful with our words and the oral tradition is much more, how to put it, they're, they're potent. They're not just thrown out. Like you said, when you look at libraries full of words, published words, they're very, very carefully articulated and shared. Um, can you speak a little bit again about the, the economy of words and the potency of words in the oral tradition? I'm a poet. I think poetry is the, is the crown of literature. And it is so because it is such a careful, um, it, it is such a careful usage uh, of words, of language. In poetry, there is no room for extraneous matter. Every word has to count. And so poetry teaches us how to, teaches us about the economy of language and how to, how, to, how to make the most of it, how to create things in words that are beautiful and powerful and long lasting, immortal even. Mm -hmm. So I have a great respect for, for, uh, for that. Uh, and I was thinking that, um, you know, uh, there, are, there are three things that distinguish the human animal, I think. If one is truly to realize his humanity, one must, uh, one must be thankful. It must be of a moral uh, conviction. He must be kind and he must be patient. All of these things are what a, a human ought to be. And language helps us to be those things. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Powerful, powerful. I'm thinking of your beautiful poems and um, so many of them. Um, and I love a story you share about a, a poem, of course, you wrote that for you, maybe sometimes, maybe always, writing poetry is like falling in love. And you have a beautiful poem about that, the excitement, the thrill of it, the, the trepidation. Um, that was beautifully put. So if writing- Thank you. 
Yes, <laughs> beautifully put. If you if you want to read it, it would be great. Um, writing poetry is like falling in love, but you're also a painter. So is is painting that same quality or is it something different? What kind of lover is the the image on the the page as opposed to the poetic words? Writing and painting are very different occupations. Mm -hmm. um, both, both are expressions of the spirit and I value both of them very much. And to me, they exist uh, uh, next to each other and they are, in, we are in, they are in good relation to each other. I find that writing requires a greater concentration than does painting. Uh, I can paint and listen to music or listen to a ball game even but I cannot write and do that. You know, I have to put all of my focus upon the, the, the writing. So they're different, but they're both uh, valid expressions of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, I love how much movement you capture in your paintings. Uh, in your new book, Earth Keeper, you have some illustrations of some dancers and they really seem alive to me in there. Um, there there's so much movement uh, in those you know, two-dimensional images. So you really capture movement and flow. And getting back to language again, um, I've been fortunate to work with many folks who are deeply involved with being language keepers, indigenous language revitalization. I'm sure you have too. And so many speak about, especially with our Algonquian language, the Anishinaabe and um, Potawatomi and the Blackfeet and the Cree, it's very much verb-based as opposed to noun-based. And it's so mm. much more about <clears throat> movement and flow and dy dynamics rather than things. And um, I just want you to speak a little bit about the movement and the flow that you capture so well in both your poetry and in your paintings and how you maintain that dynamism, even in your publications or in a two-dimensional format. Fluency is very important in, in, in uh, writing and in language in general. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think about the origin of language and because I think that the acquisition of language is what made us human, as I think I said a moment ago. But uh, Lewis Thomas, the great uh, uh, scientist who was also a, an excellent writer and who wrote a book called The Fragile Species, has, a, has an essay in it entitled Communication. Uh, and in that, in that essay, he he thinks uh, of the origin of language and he said, I think I know how language began. He said, we were living in caves. We were having a terrible time communicating with each other. We were grunting, we were making signs. And then one day, a neighboring tribe came across the ridge to visit with us and they brought their children. And he said, suddenly there was a critical mass of children the children played all day long. And at the end of that day, we had language. Mm. And I love that because I think it's true. I think children are not afraid of language. They learn it at an impossible age, three or four years old, even earlier. And uh, they're not afraid of it. They like to play games with language. Language gives itself to games. In a way, poetry, writing poetry is playing, playing a game with language. So, um, I like to think about the origin of language. Several years ago, I was, I was on, on, a, on a stage with uh, the great paleoanthropologist Richard Leakey. Mm. We were talking about the origin of human being. And Richard's idea was that we became human when we became bipedal, when we could stand on our two feet and and to look out over the tall grasses and we could reach up, take fruit from the trees and so on. And I took issue with him. I said, no, Richard, we became human when we acquired language. And I still think, I think that's true, but it's an exciting subject. It really is. Yes, we don't know the exact origins, but it's very mysterious. And 
it's important, I think, these days to really learn from the power of indigenous languages um, and the oral tradition and to revive that again. Uh, when I teach students, um, I, I teach an oral literature class on occasion and I made them do an oral midterm. They didn't have to write anything. And it was just five minutes to just speak and, and sh share a story or respond to some questions that we had studied. And the students said it was the hardest exam they had ever taken because they were so used to writing and thinking and writing, but to not have a pen and paper in hand and just face someone eye to eye, heart to heart, and, and, and tell stories. It was amazing how challenging it was. Um, and I think our attention spans and our abilities to remember that embodied way of learning language and sharing language has sadly been atrophied, I think. But it's in our DNA, like you said, it's part of our blood memory. So I think it can easily be revived. I'm sure you've seen that too with some of your students over the years. You make me think of the importance of silence. And I was teaching a course in oral tradition at Stanford uh, some years ago. And I had a large uh, group of people in a, in a room, maybe a hundred students in front of me. And I appeared before them as if I were about to speak, but I didn't speak. I said nothing for a period of maybe two minutes. And what happened in the room was truly astonishing. The students could not, could not bear the silence. You know, they started shuffling their feet. They started coughing. And I could tell that they were miserable. They wanted me to say something. And I think, uh, you know, a silence can be very uh, uh, communicative, can be very meaningful. And I think that uh, in, in our period of word inflation, when there are so many printed words around and, and we expect uh, so much of our our teachers uh, in the way of uh, books and, and so on, we have forgotten how important silence can be. The, the poet understands, I think, better than most people, the importance of silence. Mm -hmm. And so does the Native American in his oral tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And th that relationship between silence and listening. Mm -hmm. They go together, yes. You can hear the silence mm -hmm. and feel it. Yes, yes. <laughs> right when we were having sound check for our audience, um, some coyotes almost literally came up to our doorstep and we had to get our cat inside. They were howling. And I thought that was a great sign, Scott, for our conversation tonight that the, the coyotes joined us early on in this conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry. No, please, I, please. I, I uh, lived for a time in a, at Jemez Pueblo, New Mexico, which is one of the Rio Grande Pueblos. And at night there, there was a river about a quarter of a mile away from where I lived. And you could hear the coyotes and the dogs. The dogs from the village would go down and they would parley. You know, they would trade dues of the day and so on. But that was a very exciting kind of thing to hear because... You had, uh, you had the creatures of the wild on the one hand and the domesticated animals on the other, but they were, they were you know, engaged in, uh, at the level of oral tradition, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're <laughs> communicating with each other. So much interspecies dialogue that we don't pay attention to as much. Much of your writings, you speak about you know, the buffalo and, and the bear and, and the dogs and... Uh, the horses and so many powerful animals. And yet, sadly, we are losing so many of them every day. And every day, uh, every day, and we don't even know the animals that we're losing, right? Or species that we're losing, like the insect world. Um, so it's mm -hmm. a it's a bittersweet time, a poignant time um, to, to remember those voices uh, in the land. You know, I've had the, uh, the privilege of visiting several prehistoric caves in Spain and in France. 
And uh, the animals, the depiction, the paintings of animals on the wall are very moving. And you understand that the artist understood those animals in a way that we do not. They were of the same world. Uh, the animals were thought to be emissaries from a world just beyond the, the wall of the cave. And they were, they were ben beneficial to us. We, they, they gave us things, we gave them things. We lived in the same world. And now I think as a result of uh, uh, the industrial revolution and the advance of what we call civilization, we have severed ourselves from that world. We, we no longer understand the animals as we once did. And it's a great loss for us. Yes, it is. Mm. It reminds me a little bit of um, one of your other quotes I love. It's a, you know, what is it? Uh, reality isn't all that it's cracked up to be. <laughs> Meaning this reality <laughs> that we've created of, you know, speed and content. I love that word, word inflation and fast paced things and things, not processes. You know, the reality isn't all it's cracked up to be. Um, say a little <laughs> bit more about that. I know you're worried about getting into trouble, but there's reality police, right? And alternative <laughs> realities. So yeah. um, I'd love to, you, for you to share a little bit more about that. Well, I go back to the distinction that I make between reality and the imagination. And uh, reality is, is something, you know, we use the word communication. We, we have overused the word. It is much too uh, available to us, that word and that concept. I think expression is equally important. It's as important as communication. And I think the imagination is equally important uh, as, as is reality. The two things are different. We, we, we know them both, we use them both. They, they define our world in so many ways, but they are different. And I think the creative person, the writer, the poet, the storyteller relies uh, more on the imagination than most of us do at, at our time in, in the world. And uh, I think we need to get some of that back. We need to put a greater emphasis on imagination, you know, a greater emphasis than we have placed upon it now mm. in recent times. I couldn't agree more. There is so much emphasis on, you know, mathematics and engineering and, and science, which is very wonderful and fascinating. I studied science most of my life, a little bit of a love-hate relationship with science. Um, but I agree the the creativity of the artist, my partner is a musician and lives in a world of sound, always listening and, and yeah. imagining sounds. And I think that it's so important that we really revitalize those artistic, imaginative uh, possibilities within the human again. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to get to where we need to go and, and survive, I think, these the global crisis that we're in right now. It was Einstein, Albert Einstein, who said that imagination was more important than knowledge also. Uh, and the different types of imagination um, that you know can lead you into the unknown and into the great mystery. And for many native peoples, we've always honored the great mystery, right? It's not a personified God per se. Um, it is something that is unknown and perhaps unknowable, and yet is very felt and expressed. And you end your book with a beautiful poem, which is really a prayer in honor of the great mystery and the, the humility and tenderness in which you speak to it is so inspiring because in this you know, fast paced world, mystery is considered something to be stamped out and investigated and dissected and we need answers. So can you speak a bit about the power and importance of mystery? Yes, yes, mystery is, is uh, profound, you know, in itself. Um, I don't think we can, I don't think we can live without mystery. I don't know how many of us are willing to admit that, but I, I'm pretty sure that's true. Mystery is, uh, you know, what we do not know 
is important to us. Um, there is always that which is beyond knowledge. Language itself is limited. We have not reached the limits of it, but we know that it is limited. And uh, I think that think of as as reality ah, it is mystery it is the unknown it is the imagined the imagined world and uh, that is extremely important to us we had better learn something more about it than we know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to honor it with the reverence and the humility uh, that it deserves mm -hmm. yes you yeah You've spoken beautifully also about the role of art and artists to disturb, right? It's not just to make us feel good, um, but really true art should disturb like a storm. And in your wonderful, the film about you, Words from a Bear, you tell the story of um, the storm spirit and your mother and father's different relationships with storms based on their relationship to the spirit of the storm. And, you know, one was befriended that spirit of the storm and one was a little more, your mother trepidatious and, you know, a little afraid of that storm. And so speak a little bit about the role of artists and art in that kind of creative disturbance, just like storms create for the earth. I like uh, art that disturbs. Um... I like the paintings of Francis Bacon, for example. Um, I, I wrote a book called The Ancient Child and my hero in that book was an artist, a painter. And uh, he declared that he painted in order to astonish God. <laughs> and I, 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 you know, to me, that's a disturbing idea, but it is, it somehow, it somehow indicates the vitality of art. It should be disturbing. Um, you know, the great writer Franz Kafka, in a letter to Oscar Pollock in 1909, apparently they had been talking about the kind of books to read. And uh, Pollock had said, well, we ought to read books that make us happy. We ought to. We ought to. And, and Kafka wrote back, anybody can write that kind of book. <laughs> a book should be disturbing. You know, it should come like a blow to the head. Uh, a, a book should be, and this is his, his, one of his quotes, a book should be the axe for the frozen sea within us. Mm. And I've always thought that's a pretty good definition of, of literature. You know, literature is not, of course, there is a kind of literature that, it, that entertains and that makes us feel good about ourselves. And we have nursery rhymes and so on. Children's literature is valid. But if we really talk about the greatness of literature, we think about books that disturb us, books that are Moby Dick, for example. That's not a happy book, but it is a great book. That's the kind of book that interests me most. Yes, yes, I agree. Uh, we need to be challenged and surprised and question our assumptions and our worldviews from time to time to keep renewing them and to keep learning, right? I think it's, and, and to keep some kind of understanding of our, our creative ignorance that we have to keep learning and um, art is so helpful in opening up those spaces within us. Beautiful. Um, I have one more question for you before we open up to, I see our audience is starting to share many questions with you, Scott, and I wanna to get to those. Um, but I was very fortunate to just uh, co-edit a beautiful volume, um, a collection of poetry and stories and essays. And the title of the book is actually a question. And the question is, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? And I would like to ask you that question. I want to be the kind of ancestor that leaves uh, the world a little better than I found it and a world that is uh, beneficial to my children and grandchildren and progeny down, down, all the way down the line. Oh, turtles all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. 
beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Well, I I can uh, not assure you, but I can say that what the legacy that you have left has made the world such a better place. I'm so grateful for your words and, and your poetry and your stories and the gift, the treasure that it's given, you know, my generation and it, countless generations, um, I hope and pray after us. Well, I, I'm grateful to you too, Melissa, and I wish we could go on talking because there's so much to say about the things so we've discussed. Much. Exactly. <laughs> and with that, and maybe we will uh, over a, a walk in, the, in Santa Fe at some point, or when you come to uh, California or in Arizona, uh, You're right. So many great <laughs> questions coming in. So I'd like to start sharing some of those. Uh, this is a question here that says, Scott, you have mentioned the power of poetry and art. How can we best support Native American creatives? There are emerging a uh, great many young artists, writers, and painters in the Native American world. And we need to, um, we need to know who they are. We need to take a good look at, at what they do and uh, formulate an, uh, an appreciation of what they do. And by, that, uh, the, by those means, we can uh, encourage the proliferation of, of uh, Native art. So it's a matter of education first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. education and fellowships and scholarships um, and yes art gallery openings yes many ways to support uh, Native American painters and poets and dancers and sculptors yes thank you for that question uh, another question from the audience with the pandemic negatively impacting First Nations and Native peoples at such a high level, what can the new administration do to improve their livelihoods? Can understand as much as that administration can, the situation as it exists in various populations of Native Americans, and then do something about it, uh, provide medication and, uh, and uh, the education of how to deal with the pandemic, wearing masks, keeping distances, uh, mm. being, being very uh, careful of oneself and one's family and one's uh, people. That's, that's the, that is the short answer. It's a complicated question, but that's how you begin, I think. Is there a story or a myth or a past experience from your lifetime that inspires you in these very uncertain times? Many stories inspire me. Some of them uh, seem particularly pointed to the situation that we're in now with the pandemic and, and other kinds of uh, turmoil. Um, I think of the calendars, you know, the Kai was and like the Dakota uh, kept calendars and some of the entries in the calendar, they're pictographic. So they have little, little pictures uh, along with the date and, and the, you understand the, the significance of the historical moment simply on that basis, it's visual. And, but but uh, some of the stories are very sad. For example, um, I think it was 1834, an entry in the Kiowa calendars records the, uh, a smallpox epidemic that destroyed an unbelievable number of people. I think that same epidemic destroyed at least one third of the inhabitants on the Great Plains. So there were these terrible things, you know, and, and I think of those and I'm, I'm inspired to um, understand better the, the pandemic that we are suffering now. And uh, that sort of thing gives us the, the uh, encouragement to do something about it if we can. And I think we all can, we can handle ourselves much better than we have in terms of, uh, you know, 
protecting ourselves against the pandemic. So there are things like that in my life. I've, I've had a number of such experiences that uh, seem designed to, to uh, uh, fit me more, more comfortably into the, into the world in which I live. If I may, yeah, it reminds me of my Potawatomi brother and sister, Robin Kimmerer and Kyle White speak a lot about being relocated and how the, you know so many native peoples were brutally and forcefully relocated and you know from the northern plains to the desert or like Geronimo from the desert to the swampy Everglades of Florida. And that, that was a type of climate change because they, their whole community had to rapidly adapt to a completely different geography and climate and landscape. And, yeah. you know, many perished and yet many survived and the resilience of native people to adapt to such profound changes in climate. They refer to it as, you know, a climate change. Native people have been through climate changes before, not only that, but remembering long ago, 10,000, 20,000 years ago, we have stories of, you know, long ago, um, the time before with climate changes. Uh, and then your stories about the pandemics and the epidemics um, with smallpox, et cetera. And, you know, they were brutal and many people perished. And yet, you know, our ancestors, many of them survived. Scott, you and I wouldn't be here, right? Without those survivors um, of many of those. Um, so I find great hope in that, you know, our people have gone through very difficult times before and that um, we can get through these difficult times as well. Uh, one of the other uh, audience members said, I so enjoyed the story that you told of the bear. I think your name, Story of the Bear. Uh, do you have any other book recommendations for Native American mythologies and stories like that? There are a number of books that are engaging and good representations of Native American oral tradition uh, you know, I'm thinking of a, of a book called In the Trail of the Wind. I'm not sure it's still in print, but it's uh, edited by um, John Beerhorst. Oh, it's yeah. a wonderful anthology of, of uh, Native American oral tradition. Some of it's very beautiful. For example, uh, there's, a, there's a formula from your people, Melissa, that goes, mm -hmm. as my eyes search the prairie, I feel the summer in the spring. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, evocation of, uh, of uh, evanescence, you know, split moment in time when the seasons change and you, you feel one season in another. That's a wonderful concept and beautiful literature, beautiful oral tradition. So there are a number of books that, of that kind. Beerhorst, I think, uh, edited two such anthologies and uh, there, there are any number of things that are available now. Joy Harjo, my friend Joy Harjo, who is the poet laureate of the United States now, is I think she's just completed, an, uh, completed an, an anthology of Native American writings, uh, which probably stem from oral tradition. So that's a book I haven't yet seen. I'm not sure it's out yet, but it's imminent. And I'm sure that's valuable. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, Linda Hogan, the Chickasaw author, um, like you, a poet, novelist, essayist, has a new book coming out about um, her radiant life with animals and, and animal stories. So that's coming out, I think, this very soon as well. So yeah, the Native American literature is, there's so much out there right now um, that, that you can find, hopefully. Linda Hogan's a fine writer. Yes, yes, beautiful work, beautiful work. Um, another question from the audience. Native American cultures are frequently appropriated. How best can we approach mass appropriation? Oy, oy vey. <laughs> 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 to borrow a, or another culture's term, I appropriated just there. <laughs> 
How do you how do you answer a question of that magnitude? Yes, that's you, a you, big <laughs> one. That's a big one. Yeah. You understand the value of each culture. You know, we have diversity is such a such an important uh, consideration in Native American in the Native American world. There are so many different tribes, so many different languages. So it's important to understand them individually, if possible. You know, the, the problems, if, if I may say so, of one tribe are not those of another necessarily. They're very different one from another. And so in order to stay the appropriation of cultures, you need to understand something about one culture to begin with and go from there uh, expanding. I would also add, um, always asking for permission, you know, to, to use or to borrow something. We now have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and it's many wonderful articles that really speak to protecting the rights and sanctity of Indigenous people's knowledge and practices. And um, there's one article in there that speaks very much about um, free, prior, and informed consent. Kind of a mouthful, not very poetic, um, very legalistic, but very important um, for uh, working with Native Americans, ensuring that a community or an individual has, you have free, prior, and informed mm -hmm. consent. Um, that's, that's a really important one. And then I love how um, Robin Kimmerer adapted uh, the Honorable Harvest um, in terms of the original instructions of many Native peoples for gathering plants. When you go and gather sweet grass or acorns or whatever it is, um, elderberries, um, that you ask for permission, you make an offering. Um, she has really summarized well the honorable harvest. And I think that's a good way of thinking about gathering knowledge as well. Um, a very important way that's rooted in ethics, um, just in terms of addressing your large appropriation question. Those are some other um, resources. Uh, Jen Shook, who identifies herself, um, says, thank you so much for your work and your time. Would you talk more about your work in theater and what do you hope it will do? What are you seeing and what do you hope to see in Native theater? Mm, fun, great question. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the, I think the, <clears throat> the principal um, example of oral tradition in our time is theater. Uh, you, can, you can go and see a production of Hamlet, for example, and you see people alive on the stage, talking to each other and making contact with the audience and using all kinds of devices uh, uh, to, for, for the expression of their, of their spirit and of their message body language, gestures, uh, uh, eye contact with the audience. Um, and of course, the voice, the human voice, which is essential. That is the, the, the marrow of the oral tradition. And uh, my experience with theater has been uh, not, not as great as I'd like it to have been. I have written three plays and uh, seen them all produced, which is was very gratifying to me. I like uh, I like to I like to uh, I like to see plays performed. I like to write them, and I have a strong respect for for uh, playwrights, the kind of work they do. One of my great friends was uh, uh, Bernard Pomerantz, who wrote *The Elephant Man*. And he and I would talk about theater a great, de great deal. It was always to my benefit and greatly enjoyable. So I, I have a vested interest in theater. When I was in college, I acted in uh, the, the Death of a Salesman. I was Uncle Charlie. And I must say, I was uh, a really good, a really good Uncle Charlie. Yeah, I think there's so much more that can be done. I know here in San Francisco many years ago, um, some Karuk and Hupa folks uh, worked with some shadow puppet 
a shadow puppet theater and incorporated stories of coyote, um, the travels of coyote up and down the rivers, um, getting into mischief and adventures using um, shadow puppetry. And that was really beautiful, kind of melding different traditions and but honoring the oral tradition of those coyote stories of the Iraq yeah. and Karuk people. It was beautiful. It was a traveling show. It was really wonderful. Uh, thanks for that fun question, uh, Jen. And let's see here. Um, Lila June. Hello, wonderful Lila June, a great poet herself, is asking, if there was a university dedicated to Indigenous knowledge through Indigenous pedagogical methods, what would you teach Native students there and how would you teach it? Ooh, what a great question. It's a great question. I would teach them to I would teach them to appreciate their own their own investment in language and in art. Um, I think I think native peoples do not always understand the importance of their of what kind of contribution they can make to the world at large. They need to understand that because the the Native American has great gifts. You know, his, uh, his oral tradition is second to none, I think. He has a wonderful sense of humor. He has a regard for the earth and for the sacred. And uh, so he needs to understand the value of those things in himself and in others of his kind, other tribal people, because that the world, the world of the Native American is very rich in terms of art and beauty uh, uh, respect, understanding, reverence, the sacred. So I like the idea of having such a university mm -hmm, and uh, I would like to, I would like to offer my services as a professor there <laughs> for a semester anyway. <laughs> oh, wonderful. All right, Lila, got some work ahead. Wonderful <laughs> question and wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Another question um, comes in an age of increased isolation and technological communication, how can we best practice and honor the oral tradition? It always begins with understanding what it is and what it does, how valuable it is in, in our lives. We all have an oral tradition. Uh, I'm not sure how many of us are aware of it. We deal in it every day. Um, and we ought, we ought to understand the, the, uh, the value of it. You know, um, the oldest poem in the English language, as far as I know, is Beowulf. And it was an oral composition before it was a written composition. And uh, I like to think of uh, someone in, say, ninth or 10th century England attending a recitation of Beowulf in a, in a glade in the forest and what it must have meant to the people to hear, you know, the story of Beowulf, so exciting, so engaging, so full of wonder, it, you know, it had to, it had to leave them uh, 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 breathless and their lives would never be the same again. That is the power of the oral tradition. And uh, I've forgotten the question, but anyway, that was partial mm -hmm. answer to it, I think. No, that yeah. completely. How to best honor the oral tradition. Yes. Practice it. Yeah. Right? Practice, Practice it. it. Yes. Tell stories. Listen to stories. Yeah. Yes. And if you if you read poetry, read it aloud. Read it aloud. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a Native American formula that goes, in the beginning was the word and it was spoken. I like that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I do too. And so many of our creation stories begin with sound. Yes. Mm -hmm. Something was spoken, a great sound, a drum or a rattle or some sacred sound was created. And that created what you know, yes. physicists would call the yeah. big bang. But our big bang was the big drum bang or the big <laughs> rattle bang. Yes. <laughs> right. yes. Yes. So listening to that cosmic sound. Wonderful. 
let's see. Um, while animal and plant extinctions are at an all time high, how can I best educate myself and take action to try to improve the situation? I uh, watch the National Geographic channel. Uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, read uh, read as much as you can about and as much as you have time for about books uh, dealing with the the extinction of animals and the preservation of animals. There are a lot of them now, uh, probably more than you can keep up with. But read into that subject and learn as much as you can. And if you have the knowledge, then you are prepared to do something about it. So that's that's uh, my advice. Yes. And I would, I would just add, you know, this is where that adage, um, you know, think globally, act locally. Wherever you are, there's endangered species in your backyard. Learn about, you know, mm -hmm. their plight. Is it the water? Is it, you know, pollution? Is it the dam upriver? Um, and you can do something about it. You can get engaged with local communities who are trying to clean up and restore watersheds that are harming the salmon or the fish or, you know, that's fragmenting habitat. And um, there's many, many ways to get involved with conservation of habitat for the beautiful creatures that are, that are sadly going away um, because their homes are being so encroached upon. So every day, you know, we can make choices about the foods we eat and how the transportation we use that impacts the land and impacts the um, habitat of many, many species. Um, yes. Uh, here's a complex, uh, exciting, complex question. Uh, doctor from Jen, Dr. Mama Day, you speak so beautifully of blood memory, but sometimes the language of blood can feel too close or too dangerous and close to racist rhetorics. Have you grappled with any responses to those concerns? Can you talk a bit more about memory in the blood? If if the if the if the word blood uh, trips you up, I often use the word cellular memory, and I use the word um, racial memory sometimes. But that's another problem, isn't it? Um, cellular um, and uh, genetic genetic memory those those are synonymous, I think, with blood memory. So you need choose whichever whichever word you want. The meaning is the same, I think. Right, right. And yet I think there's really something very powerful about that concept, right, with Native folks, mixed like myself, you know, that it has more gravity or there's something in it that just speaks so loudly um, in our different heritages, even with multiracial or mixed heritages that native um, ancestry um, seem to speak, speaks very strongly. Um, I love how um, the great poet John Trudell rephrased DNA, you know, it's not just deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, DNA is our descendants and ancestors. <laughs> that's yeah. our real DNA, our descendants and ancestors. So that's about blood memory as well. I like, um, I, I like the term blood memory. I think it's I think it's interesting to think of memory residing in the blood and moving in the blood to, mm -hmm. to yeah mm -hmm. to the surface that's that interests me and bones too i like bones blood and bones i like those things yes and you said something very beautiful earlier about the marrow yeah mm. yeah um, many people are asking for you to read one of your luscious poems, Scott. So um, would you honor us and, and possibly reading um, anything that you would like that you have in your memory that you feel moved to share? Um, certainly um, there were some in your new, in the Earth Keeper book that are just gorgeous. So I'll leave it up to you, or I can make a recommendation. <laughs> I, I, I don't have anything from which to read right here. Mm -hmm. I can recite something. Perfect. Uh, all right, I have a poem which uh, is entitled The Bear. Mm. 
and it's a syllabic poem and uh, it was uh, awarded a Academy of American Poets Prize when I was a student at Stanford. It goes like this. What ruse of vision escarping the wall of reeds, lending incision into countless surfaces would cull and color his somnolence whose old age has outworn valor, all but the fact of courage. Seen, he does not come, move, but seems forever there, dimensionless, dumb in the windless noon's hot glare. More scarred than others these years since the trap maimed him, pain slants his withers, drawing up the crooked limb. Then he is gone, whole, without urgency from sight, as buzzards control imperceptibly their flight. That's the bear. Thank you, thank you. So beautiful, wow. I saw so many things as you were reciting that. <laughs> Just gorgeous. Thank you. You're um, welcome. I have one more question, and then there's one more from the audience. I think I'll ask this one from the audience, and then I'll keep mine for last. Uh, what advice do you have for aspiring writers, painters, and artists? Um, begin something. Uh, if you if you aspire to be a writer, write. Put down a word or a sentence on the page and build upon it. That's uh, the best kind of exercise that I can that I know, and that's advice. That's that's uh, an ad, uh, a matter of advice that I share with all of my students. Get get something going. You know, start. I had a good friend, uh, a t uh, an artist whose name is Fritz Scholder. You probably know of him. Oh, he was a great uh, incredible a, painter and. Uh, incredible painter and a, and a very good friend of mine but i one day i asked him how do you start a painting and he said i i asked do you have something in mind do you have a subject in mind what are you going to paint and he said you know most of the time i don't have something in mind i cover the, the canvas with paint just cover it with paint and that is my beginning once i've done that i can go on with it and i can complete a painting so same, my, same thing might apply to writing. Put down a word or a sentence and see what comes of it. Do it. Practice. Yes. Thank you. Just Thank you. do it. Is that Just what, do yeah. it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, great. Well, I have a way. I see one more really intriguing question here that is really related to my last one. So I'm going to combine them. Speaking of the Big Bang, could native cosmologies help us foster our creative imaginations as we consider new approaches to the challenges facing humanity in the 21st century? I, I, I love the first part of that, which is cosmology. How do you, how do you approach it? You go out and look at the stars and you you're filled with wonder. You have to be filled with wonder. And that's a word that I meant to talk more about this evening. Wonder is crucial, crucial to our, to our uh, well-being. To know wonder is to be profoundly alive. And so I think you can approach cosmology on that basis. You look at the stars, you wonder about the, the infinity of space and, and, uh, how can you not be inspired uh, by that and filled with wonder, filled with wonder and delight? Another word. Mm -hmm. uh, Beautiful. And you I'm not sure I I'm not sure I got to the second part of that question. I'm and I'm not sure I can answer it, but it was interesting. I think you I think you did it. And it's related to um, some of the beautiful stories you tell at the end of Earth Keeper, you speak about mortality and stars, and you speak about the far camps. 
and that was very comforting to me. I lost my father this year and, and mm. was thinking of him in a far camp. And uh, in our last few minutes together, if you can tell a, a star story or a star poem, I mean, you already started to. And that relationship from your Kiowa worldview of mortality and the stars, immortality. Yes, yes. Well, you know the the, the star the star story uh, in my uh, that is that is uppermost in my experience is the the story of the seven sisters who were born into the sky and became the stars of the Big Dipper. Um, some years ago, long after I had become an adult, uh, I I made a vision quest, and I went to Tsoai, Devil's Tower, and I camped there for four days and fasted. And indeed, I did have my vision, and it was related intimately to the to the rock tree and to the bear. So uh, that's uh, that's my that's my story of the bear. I fasted for four days and had nothing but tea. And uh, I think on the fourth day, I was camped. I had a little tent, and I camped at the at the base of uh, of uh, Tsoai. But it was a campground. And there were other people camping there. And I had to wake up in my fast to the smell of bacon frying in the camps. <laughs> it's enough to drive you crazy. Torture. I, it might have enhanced my vision. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. What a, a beautiful image. And, and humor, I wanted to ask a little bit more of, but you just demonstrated it in such a lovely way. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Scott, Mama thank Day, you, Melissa. What a treat to be in conversation with you. And thank you to all of our audience and participants for your great questions and your listening spirit um, being with us this evening. And um, uh, Chi Miigwech, um, thank you so much. And uh, I will pass this over now back to um, our main uh, event producer, Alex from CIS Public Programs. Thank you so much for attending this evening. We hope you will join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded. So if you would like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at this very same link and on our Facebook page later. We will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at www.ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.